Hello, I'm Mark Drummond. I'm the Judicial Director of the Civil Jury Project at the NYU School of Law. Courts around the country are looking to see if virtual trials will work. What you're about to see is an edited version of a three-hour virtual trial we held on May 28th. But first, we'll look at the preparation it takes. Virtual trials can be held on numerous video conferencing platforms. Here's what you'll need to run a virtual trial smoothly. A video conferencing license with no time limit. A reliable internet connection. The judge will need a computer connected to two monitors. A tech assistant is recommended for the first day of trial to check in jurors so that the judge can handle any pretrial matters. After the first day, the judge should be able to conduct the trial without the tech assistant's help. Each attorney also should have a computer connected to two monitors. Jurors and witnesses will each need their own computer. The bailiff will need a computer so they can tend to the jury room. Lastly, you'll need to set up a number of virtual rooms that will be used during the trial and provide virtual backgrounds to all participants. We're ready to start off on a civil trial called Needle Liquor Commission versus Cut Rate Liquor and Jones. I thank all of you for keeping your microphones muted while this process goes on so there's no backlash going on in the microphones. Both sides have agreed to six jurors with no alternates. Each juror's tile should identify them as a juror and display their name. The judge should instruct jurors to use speaker view so they'll see the attorney asking them questions in the largest tile possible. Yes, Your Honor, thank you. May it please the court and good afternoon, everyone. Um, and first of all, uh, my name is Eric Rosen and I represent the Need of Liquor Commission. Juror number one, Tell me, do you have any, any negative feelings just based on your life experience towards police officers? No, I do not. Thank you. Number 11, I understand that you have a, a close friend that was harmed by alcohol. Is that my understanding? Yeah, I don't, I don't really feel comfortable answering this in front of everyone. Is there a way we can? What I'm going to do, uh, ladies and gentlemen, we are going to um, go to sidebar with juror number 11. Um, during that time, it'll be outside of your presence. We're going to talk at sidebar. Um, I'm going to go to a breakout room with juror number 11 and both counsel to talk about this issue at sidebar. Okay. During sidebars and breaks, jurors should be placed in the jury room, since the main courtroom still will be viewed by the public. This lets jurors talk with each other or take a break. The judge should give jurors the best estimate for the length of the break. Thank you very much, uh, ladies and gentlemen, for your patience. Does defense have any questions for the jurors? Do any of you, for any reason whatsoever, and it doesn't matter, have any negative feelings about people who sell alcohol for a living? If you have any concerns about that, if you could, could raise your hand for me, please. That's a juror number one. And that's Ms. Uh, Lady. Hello. Yes, yes, hello. Um, I, I perhaps should have mentioned this earlier. Um, I, I do not drink alcohol for religious reasons. I don't necessarily blame anyone for, for drinking alcohol or selling alcohol. I just wanted to mention it that um, uh, I do not have experience drinking alcohol. Each side, for the purposes of this exercise, is allowed to excuse one juror. Eric, would you like to exercise one of your friends? Your Honor, we accept the first six. All right, thank you. Um, Ms. Parker, would you like to exercise any of your preferences? Yes, Your Honor. Uh, we would like to strike juror number five, Ms. Dunn. All right. Juror five, uh, you're excused. Uh, you just have to leave the meeting, and I appreciate that. Thank you. Um, so then, with that being said, 9, 10, 11, 12, you are excused. I'll wait for everyone, those jurors to leave the meeting. The only tiles remaining after selection should be the jurors, the judges, and the attorneys. And now we have our six jurors. In the city of Nita, if a company or corporation or a liquor store is going to sell alcohol to the public, they have to follow certain rules. They are not allowed to sell alcohol, knowingly sell alcohol to someone who is intoxicated. It's not permitted. Hopefully everyone can see this. 
And the only question is, did the defendant Dan Jones knowingly sell intoxicating beverage uh, to an intoxicated person in violation of the rule that everyone has to follow? And the answer is yes. And you're going to see, and this is going to be the verdict question that you have at the end of the case. Ms. Parker, on behalf of the defense, opening statement. Thank you, Your Honor. May it please the court. Here's the most important thing you're going to hear about my client's case today. And that is that Dan Jones has no burden of proof. The plaintiff has the entire burden of proof. And right now, the plaintiff is at zero. Dan Jones, my client, is the only witness who knows what happened. Investigator Beer could not see what happened inside that store. That's because he wasn't there. He was way down the street, sitting in a parked car, about 65 feet away. Uh, the plaintiff calls investigator James Beer. You swear to tell the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth, in this case now in hearing? I do. Uh, investigator Beer, uh, what is your occupation? Who do you work for? I work for the uh, Nida City Liquor Commission. I want to bring your attention to the night of June 5th of last year, 2019. Uh, where were you assigned? Uh, I was assigned to an intersection at uh, 7th Street in Jackson in Nita City. Why were you out there? Why were you at Cut Rate Liquor? You know, objection that calls for hearsay under Rule 801. Objection was overruled. You may continue, Counsel. I'm going to bring up uh, a demonstrative. Where were you stationed, uh, Investigator Beer, that night? If you look to the bottom right corner of the diagram there, I was in a vehicle with the D under it. The letter D under it. And at approximately 845 or so, what did you notice on the corner of 7th and Jackson Avenue? On the corner of 7th and Jackson, I noticed uh, a gentleman who I later ended up identifying as Walter Watkins. And he started to walk south across 7th Street towards the uh, cut rate liquor store. But he was all over the place. I remember halfway across the street, he stumbled and he almost fell. Uh, but he caught himself, and he kept walking, and when he got to the other side of 7th Street, he uh, encountered a curb there, and I think he tripped over the curb, and he, like, again, he almost he almost fell to the ground, but he stuck his arms out to kind of brace himself, and eventually caught himself, but he was stumbling all over the place, and he was charged with uh, public intoxication. Thank you, Investigator Beer. I have no further questions. Ms. Parker. So, Investigator Beer... You were not inside the store, were you? No, I was not. You were sitting in a parked car down the street, correct? Uh, I don't know if I would say down the street, but I was sitting in a parked car. It was across the street. And your only view into the store was through the window on the storefront, correct? That's correct, yeah. Now, in your own words, in the report you filed, your view sitting in that parked car was obstructed. That's a word you used, obstructed by the advertisements on the windows, correct? That's correct. Uh, thank you, Investigator Beer. Your Honor, I have no further questions. Thank you. Redirect the plaintiff? No, Your Honor. At this time, the plaintiff rests. Is the defense going to be calling any witnesses? Yes, Your Honor. Thank you. Uh, we would like to call Dan Jones, my client, to the stand. Witnesses can be sequestered in virtual waiting rooms or can be given a time to appear for the trial, with the judge then granting them permission to join. I'd like to start by asking you some questions about your job. Where do you work? Uh, I am the night manager at a liquor store called Cut Rate Liquors. Mr. Jones, I I've put on the screen there a diagram. Uh, could you just take a minute and tell, use that diagram and tell the jury about the setup of the store? Absolutely. Uh, well, as you can see here, uh, the store is, uh, it sits on a corner. Uh, the door is, uh, has a bunch of security bars on it, um, and the windows themselves have uh, advertisements, logos, uh, things like that um, on the tops and bottoms of them. What's shown there on the screen is Exhibit 2. Is that what the windows looked like on June 5th of 2019? Yes, ma'am. What happened inside the store on June 5th of 2019? There was a, there was a lot going on. Um, at no point do I recall 
ever making a sale to someone who appeared to me to be intoxicated. Your Honor, I have no further questions of this witness. Cross-examination, Mr. Ryan. Thank you, Your Honor, and may it please the court. And uh, good afternoon, Mr. Jones. How are you, sir? Good afternoon. Uh, doing well. You're not saying you didn't sell wine to the guy who was ultimately arrested, Walter Watkins. You're saying you just don't know? I'm saying that I don't recall Mr. Watkins one way or the other. See no evil, hear no evil, speak no evil, right? I'm sorry? Nothing. No further questions, sir. Thank you so much. Redirect, counsel. No, thank you, Your Honor. I think this might be uh, a good time to everyone mute your computers and allow uh, a three-minute recess to use the restroom, stand up, and stretch. Mr. Rosen, are you ready for closing argument? Yes, Your Honor. There's absolutely no doubt that Dan Jones knew or should have known that he was selling alcohol to someone who was intoxicated. There's absolutely no doubt. And so um, the answer to that question is yes. There's an old saying, if it looks like a duck, if it swims like a duck, if it quacks like a duck, it's probably a duck. He had slurred speech, bloodshot glass eyes, all of the signs, all the signs that, that someone is intoxicated. And so when you answer that question, whether he knew or should have known, you know, the, the, the answer is absolutely yes. That's his job to know. That was his job to know, to not sell to someone who was intoxicated. And so use your common sense when you make the decision in this case. If it looks like an intoxicated person, it walks like an intoxicated person, talks like an intoxicated person, smells like an intoxicated person, Dan Jones should have known that Walter Watkins was intoxicated. And that's why he's here today. Thank you, Mr. Rosen. Uh, closing argument on behalf of the defense. Ladies and gentlemen, before you heard from Mr. Rosen, you heard from the judge himself that the plaintiff has the burden of proof here. And the bottom line here, what I'm gonna spend my time talking to you about is that the plaintiff has not proven its case. They want you to focus on what may have happened at the street corner or down the street or out on the sidewalk, but that's not what's important. What's important is what happened inside the store. So why is the plaintiff doing that? Why are they focused on what happened outside? Well, the reason for that is they only have one witness that they brought to you and investigator Beer was outside. He didn't see the duck inside the store. He didn't hear what the duck said inside the store. He didn't see how the duck walked inside the store after he had straightened up. And you didn't hear from the duck himself, and that was Mr. Watkins. So, ladies and gentlemen, the plaintiff simply has not proven its case to you. Ladies and gentlemen, this case is now in your hands for a verdict. And Andrea will place the eight jurors in the jury box along with our bailiff. When the six jurors are placed into their jury room, they get exhibits ordered by the judge and a set of jury instructions for each juror. The bailiff will tend to the jury, muting the audio feed but keeping the video feed active to monitor the room to make sure no juror leaves except during agreed upon breaks. The bailiff also can alert the court if jurors have a question for the court and counsel. Sorry to interrupt. A verdict has been reached. The jurors can render their verdict in writing via a software program such as DocuSign, or the judge could poll the jury on the record. Jurors, welcome back. You've reached a verdict. Is that correct? Yes. Please announce your verdict publicly, how the jury finds the jury finds um, uh, votes in favor of the plaintiff. I'll now go through the five major points of feedback that the six jurors gave us after our trial. The feedback from the jurors fell into five different categories. They first let us know that it would have been helpful had they known that there was tech help available at the beginning. One juror had her computer crash twice, and she said it would be helpful and lessen her anxiety if she knew that help was available. She was worried about being late for court. One juror said he felt more comfortable revealing personal information over Zoom. He said he felt this would be more comfortable than revealing the information in person in front of 50 to 75 other people. One of the overarching suggestions was that we give them a better idea about timing. 
They wanted to know when the day would start, when the day would end, the number of breaks, when those breaks would occur, and the amount of time for each break. Many said that if they knew this in advance, they could arrange for child care or pet care and perhaps be better able to serve as a juror if they knew this information. They told us that they should be instructed to turn off all notifications on their computer since that was distracting. And they also wanted to know, to know what they could or could not do during breaks. When they go back to the virtual jury room, they should be able to talk and bond among themselves with the admonitions that the judge usually gives to not decide any aspect of the case until all of the evidence is in. They did not know what they could do, whether they could talk among themselves, whether they could check their emails, or whether they could return emails, or even go on the internet. So they need strict guidance as to what is allowed and what is not allowed in the virtual jury room. And finally, they told us that when their attention started to drift, that the visuals used by the attorneys were crucial in bringing their attention back to the case. Thank you for watching. There are many people to thank for this project. All of those people are listed in our June newsletter. In addition, if you want to watch the entire three-hour trial, there is a link on our website.